There have been a couple of tiki topics that I have not wanted to dive deep into, and I'll explain to you which ones those are and why. The first is Don the Beachcomber. There's just enough out there already, and while I think some people might not know the story of Don, and it may be worth retelling or exploring, there's a documentary coming out sometime soon called The Dawn of Tiki. And if you're into Tiki, I'm sure you know about it. You may have even joined the Kickstarter, and it's something you've probably been following closely for the last couple of years. That's going to be an all-encompassing look at Don the Beachcomber, and I'd rather wait to see what they can share about him. And since they'll have tons of great interviews and have done more research and a deeper dive than anyone else, I don't really see a point in us addressing Don the Beachcomber here. And the second topic I've been avoiding here is Fashionola. I've had a few people ask me about this, but mainly I don't think it's really even possible to discuss without pure speculation. And also, there's a book coming out this summer all about Passionola and Fashionola. They have an Instagram account, and I will link to that in the episode description, and I believe the book is coming out at the end of this summer. But that also means that right now is a good time to make Fashionola, since the current consensus is that there is no official historic recipe. You can basically make whatever you want, which is what I did. And that makes this so odd and confounding in the tiki and tropical world, as so many of us are so particular about every ingredient. But then I made Fashionola, and I went down the Fashionola rabbit hole. I don't think I learned anything new or super interesting, but we should probably talk a little bit about Fashionola and what it might be, and use the version that I made to make a hurricane, or two, or three, with the help of many of you who suggested what rum or rums to use. Fashionola is often called the lost tiki ingredient. It's said to be a tropical fruit syrup made with passion fruit, and that's all we really know about it. It was apparently prevalent in Don the Beachcomber drinks like the Cobra's Fang, but if you turn to the expert in Don, Jeff the Beach Bumberry, you will not find one reference to Fashionola in Beach Bum Remix, Sip and Safari, or Caribbean Potions or even in Martin Kate's Smuggler's Cove, which are the Bibles of the Tiki universe. However, it is very prevalent in this spiral-bound book from 2001 by Don the Beachcomber himself. See, it says it right there, by Don the Beachcomber. Okay, it's not by Don, but by Don's widow, Phoebe Beach and author Arnold Bittner. And when I say Arnold Bittner, the author, I'm sharing with you how I interpreted reading this book for the very first time. I imagined Phoebe Beach discovering these important recipes and documents and working with a cocktail book author. But that's also not the case, as Arnold Bittner was in fact Phoebe Beach's husband, and he was a driving force behind the creation of this book, which focused on his wife's former husband's recipes. Initially, I was maybe a little too critical of this book when I read it. The first reason had to do with blending, which we'll come back to. And the second is the declarations on the Mai Tai in this book, which are provably false and very misleading. But that is for another episode, someday, someday soon. I mentioned blending. Most of the drinks in the book are blender drinks, not drink master spindle type drinks. That's not called for once in this book, but stand up traditional blenders, slushy drinks. I was always led to believe that all of the Dawn the Beachcomber drinks were from drink master spindle type mixers. And one argument that I've heard or read is that in the 1930s and 40s, regular traditional modern style blenders didn't exist. But as I was trying to find the original hurricane recipe, I came across some Ron Rico guides from the early 1940s where they call to wearing a drink. That's using the brand wearing as a verb. At that time, Waring did not make drink master spindle style drink mixers as they do today. I have one right here, the Beast. In the 1930s, they were making these traditional upright blenders. So now, I don't even know. Should these drinks be drink master drinks or blender drinks like you'll find here in Hawaii, tropical rum drinks and cuisine? Now, an important factor of this book is that it does also call for Fashionola in many of Don's drinks and describes it as fruit flavored blends used mainly by bars use fruit punch as a substitution. I think it's that line that has encouraged so many people to sub Hawaiian punch like this bottle right here for Fashionola, but you shouldn't do that. And we're not going to do that here, but I do think someday, and I don't have a plan for this, but someday 
we should do something with Hawaiian punch because it is delicious. But it's this line in the book, fruit flavored blends used mainly by bars use fruit punch as a substitution. That's also one of the most descriptive sentences we have on Fashionola. That's all we know in regards to Don's Fashionola. We know that a company called Jonathan English from San Diego was making Fashionola in the 1950s in red, gold, and green varieties. It's possible that they invented Fashionola or at least Fashionola as a name. And this is all speculation and things that I am hoping get cleared up by the Fashionola book. There are interviews out there with Jeff Berry where he said he's tried one of these older Fashionola recipes and it was unremarkable. In the 1972 Bartender's Guide by Trader Vic, he defines Passionola as non-alcoholic syrup made from passion fruit. It comes in three colors, red, green, and natural. Natural one would assume would be gold or orange. It would also be reasonable to say that he is referring to the Jonathan English brand, but we don't know. What we do know for certain is that as early as 1929, soda fountains were serving drinks using Passionola which I believe was just passion fruit syrup, a new and exotic ingredient for that time. I've seen Don Beach get a lot of credit online for creating Fashionola since he was from New Orleans, but Passionola predates his restaurants. The Ola in Fashionola may very well be because of New Orleans, but that I also do not know, and I don't even know when people started saying Nola. I recently found a bottle of Fashionola from Cocktail and & Sons, and it is great. It is what inspired me to make my own, which I have right here, and what I want to use to make an original hurricane. And as everyone knows, Pat O'Brien's in New Orleans is famous for being the birthplace of the hurricane. Pat O'Brien's claims that they came up with the drink in the 1940s during World War II because bourbon was so expensive at that time. They experimented with passion fruit and rum, and everyone loved it. In the book, The Cocktail Companion, it shared that Pat O'Brien created the drink in 1942, but the original recipe called for lime juice, orange juice, passion fruit syrup, and four ounces of rum. And while there's no reason to doubt Pat O'Brien's history and recipe, we need to turn to our trusty old friends at Ron Rico, who in 1941 and again in 1944, shared a drink called the Hurricane Punch, with one ounce of lime juice, one ounce of lemon juice, two ounces of passion fruit syrup, and four ounces of Ron Rico Red Label Rum. Truth be told, I don't really care who invented the hurricane, but if I was a betting man, I would put my money on Ron Rico. Four ounces of rum plus passion fruit syrup does not seem like a typical recipe, and both recipes call for four ounces of rum. It makes a lot more sense to me that a rum company, not a bar, would come up with a serving of a drink that used four ounces of rum. That and the fact that this recipe was in print widely distributed in the United States starting in 1940s means that you can almost 100% guarantee that a copy of the Meekstro's Guide was available to the people at Pat O'Brien's and probably lived on the bar there. There were thousands of these out there being distributed. Basically, sorry New Orleans. And since there is no real fashionable recipe, I made one up. And that is the great consensus about Fashionola. There is no consensus, so you can do whatever you want. The only guiding principles I had was tropical flavors, passion fruit has to be the most prevalent ingredient, and no blueberries. No particular reason, just didn't want the flavor or the color. And since it is strawberry season, and I like strawberries, I wanted it to be heavy on the strawberries. My Fashionola is four parts passion fruit syrup, three parts strawberry syrup, one part pineapple syrup, one part mango syrup, one part grenadine, that's real fresh grenadine, which is essentially pomegranate syrup. I went a roundabout way of making this by making all of the syrups separately, and that was intentional. When I made the tropical standard raspberry syrup for the Bird of Paradise, I noticed how quickly and easily the raspberries broke down into a syrup, almost completely. But when I did that with strawberries, they didn't break down as far. You could put all the fruit and the sugar together, except for the pomegranates, and make syrup that way. But since I wanted to be very accurate with the amount of syrup from each fruit, and I wanted to be able to fine tune that recipe, I found it was easiest to make them all separately. You can then take that individual syrup and add it into your fashionola, or take something away if you make another batch. I know this seems like a lot of work, 
but if you have a vacuum sealer or even just Ziploc bags, it's actually pretty easy to do. The recipe to make my 750 milliliter bottle of Fashionola is 300 milliliters of passion fruit syrup, 225 milliliters of strawberry syrup, 75 milliliters of pineapple syrup, 75 milliliters of mango syrup, and 75 milliliters of grenadine. But if you don't wanna make a 750 milliliter bottle, just go back to the part where I separated out the syrups into parts. I'll include both of those in the episode description. It's the same thing. You could also do the math yourself, but it's a little easier to look at it the way of parts if you wanna develop maybe just 500 milliliters or less or more of this syrup. To make each of the fruit syrups, I put equal amounts of fruit to sugar by weight in a vacuum bag and seal. 300 grams of strawberries, 300 grams of sugar. I let them sit for 24 hours in the refrigerator and would occasionally check the bags and rearrange them or squeeze the fruit to break down any large pieces of fruit or incorporate the sugar. Passion fruit puree syrup I'm using is from Funkin and you'll need to create a syrup from it that's equal parts sugar to this passion fruit puree. Even though it does have some additional added sugar, I made this equal parts sugar to puree and then tested it on a refractometer and it came out to 50 bricks, which is a one-to-one -one syrup. You heard correctly, I tested all of these syrups with the refractometer. I'm not suggesting that you do, but if you do want to get into more exact syrup recipes, these are pretty cheap and useful. This one was just $25 on Amazon, but you do need to make sure you get the correct one. This one goes up to 85 bricks, and the way they work is you put your syrup on this slide right here, put that down, and then you just look through this hole. It's all analog, there's no batteries or anything, and it will tell you the bricks level. It can be a little difficult to look through this and get the exact measurement, but this for me is just more of a, a ballpark tool. They do make uh, $100 plus digital ones that are a better option if you're really getting into this. You could also use the frozen kind of passion fruit that I've used here before, or even pre-made passion fruit syrup, like from BG Reynolds. After 24 hours, I strained each fruit syrup, and this is where the yield will be slightly different depending on the fruit used. For example, strawberries. The yield was 70% of the starting weight, but pineapple was 72% and mango was 65%. That kind of proves the whole point that if you macerate them all at the same time, you won't necessarily really know how much syrup you're getting from each fruit, in your fashionola. But in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it matters too much. Also, just another tip if you're making syrups, you should cut up your tougher fruit like pineapple and mango into smaller pieces that will be easier for the sugar to break down. Now that we've made our fashionola, we'll make three hurricanes following the original recipe from Ron Rico, but scaled down so I don't have to use or drink four ounces of rum into each one. And to decide on what rums to use, I left it up to many of you when I asked you for your suggestions for different rum blends, and we'll do a somewhat blind taste testing. I'll have them mixed up for me, but I'm not wearing a blindfold. Each rum will have a base of one ounce of Appleton 12 and one ounce of something else. For hurricane number one, half an ounce of lime juice, half an ounce of lemon juice, one ounce of Fashionola, one ounce of Appleton 12 and one ounce of Smith and Cross. The combination of Appleton 12 and Smith & Cross was more suggested by people than any other single rum or blend. So had to do that one. Hurricane number two, same specs on our juices, one ounce of Appleton 12 and one ounce of Worthy Park 109. Hurricane number three, same specs on the juices, one ounce of Appleton 12 and just shy of one and a half ounces of El Dorado 12. El Dorado and Hamilton 86 were suggested by several people or just a Demerara rum overall. The just shy of one and a half ounces will get us closer to ABV of the other two. That means unfortunately, despite popular demand, Karuba didn't make the cut. So I'm sorry for that. I'm gonna build all three of these in drink mixer tins, flash blend them, and then have my wife pour them into the corresponding hurricane glass. And then we'll see what happens. Thank you. 
All right, the deed is done. I had my wife pour into each one of these. I don't know which one is which. You're gonna have to trust me on that one. I uh, did a poor job with the wash line here, but I also made it a smaller drink than normal. I put ice into the hurricane glasses first, and I didn't do the exact same amount because I knew we had that one drink with an extra half an ounce. I didn't know which glass was which or which tin was getting poured to which glass, so it kind of helps to not really be able to tell. This is not scientific. This doesn't actually even matter. We're just seeing if any of these are good in the name of science. So let's start with the one on my far left. I will put up on the screen uh, which one is which. I couldn't tell you what rums are in there yet, but that is great. Fashionola is the main flavor in there. It's acidity, fashionola, and rum. Don't know what it is. You make whatever this is, it'll be the best hurricane that you've ever had. Promise. All right, this is the funkiest one by far. I'm guessing Smith Across. Good, but the least interesting. One tastes like a little bit hotter, a little more ABV in this one, but I don't know. All right, Hurricane One was Smith and Cross. I think that this is it, so I'm bringing this one over here. This is the first one I tried. I think that's 109, and I think this one is the one with El Dorado. These two are very similar. I'm gonna say this is Smith and Cross, which means this one needs to be number one, which it is. I did it. All right, this one I think is 109. Oh, fuck. That means this is number three, baby. All right, I was pretending like I didn't care, but I, I did want to get this right. Uh, so many other things people are saying, you should blind taste test them. Well, I just did. So leave me alone. Not the most difficult comparison here. Uh, Smith Across, uh, far different than the other rums. Uh, I'm a little surprised though that the one with El Dorado didn't come through more. Um, I think each one of these is good. I don't want to encourage everyone to make a uh, hurricane that is half Smith and Cross. I think a lot of people still won't like it, but it goes really well with the passion fruit and the strawberries. Those are like the two nuts you're picking up from the most. Talk about the fashionola and what it tastes like. The biggest thing it tastes like is passion fruit and then strawberries. No shit. But there's a small amount of grenadine in here and the grenadine is more prevalent than the pineapple or the mango. So that's something if you were gonna make this, be maybe a little more cautious with your grenadine if you're worried that's gonna overpower things. I really do believe that taste is subjective and when people say things like they wanna use, you know, Captain Morgan rum, I say go for it. Do whatever you want, whatever you like. I don't like to be declarative with things being the best versions of things or, you know, the only way you should make something. But I will tell you that this is the best hurricane that you will ever have. And I encourage you to make a fashionola and change the recipe, modify it to what you like the most. This comes through these drinks and it is like a shining star of these three drinks. And thank you to everyone out there that contributed to uh, the request I had on Instagram and on YouTube about what rums you use. It was actually, it was super cool to see people give their opinions about what rums to use. And there were a bunch that I didn't do because I didn't want to make 10 of these, but Appleton 12 is my favorite rum. I really just like using it in whatever I can as a base rum, having one ounce of it in each of these and then using the rums that you suggested. It's great. Someone needs to do this with Karuba and let me know how it goes. All right. That's it for this one. I'm Derek, this is Make a Drink. If you enjoyed this video, if you liked the video, give it a like below. Consider subscribing to the channel and I will see you on the next video.